try to share my screen. Um, and go into full screen mode. This should be working, right? Yep. Okay, yes. cool. Yeah, I want to um, start by just thanking my lab and the various funding agencies. And the, the work that I'm going to talk about is really the work of Marcus, who started this uh, during his master thesis and uh, is sort of still continuing um, in the lab. Um, and this was also done in collaboration with Thomas Borwig, a research fellow at the Institute in the context of a project called Goal Robots that is also very cool about uh, robots that are intrinsically motivated to yeah, set their own learning goals. Um, but that, that's a different story. Um, what I want to focus on today is really recurrence and the role of recurrent connections in vision architectures, in particular when it comes to difficult vision problems like uh, recognizing things under occlusion. So there are sort of standard models of, of object recognition that we have based on deep learning frameworks and they work extremely well. Um, they sometimes reach uh, superhuman performance and they are mostly or essentially feed forward. Um, and the speed of object recognition in the brain has suggested that it may mostly be a feed forward process. But if we look into the brain, which we do see a lot of top down and lateral recurrent connectivity, uh, in, in some parts it's even more you know, feedback connections than feed forward connections. And that of course raises the obvious question is, what is this all good for? And how does the brain make use of that? And I think um, that this, there's been some evidence accumulating that for more difficult vision problems, these recurrent connections might actually play a very important role. And one difficult situation is um, object recognition in the presence of occlusions. And our brain is actually doing something pretty sophisticated there. And this is very well illustrated by this uh, well-known Bregman illusion. If you see the, the, the snippets on the left, you may have a hard time um, seeing any sort of structure, any, any gestalt in this. But if I now show the same gray pieces, but with an occluder that sort of explains away some of the missing parts, you have no problem immediately seeing that there's uh, six times the letter B. So um, our brain does something pretty sophisticated here and sort of doing inference to explain what is there, what is not there, um, and coming up with a, a proper interpretation of, of the scene of these occluded uh, letters here. And there, there are good reasons to believe that recurrent processing might actually play an important role in this. Now, so the problem of occluded object recognition is therefore I think scientifically quite interesting, but it's also of very big practical relevance. If you think of autonomous driving, you think you know pedestrians that sort of are stepping on the street and are largely occluded. So you, you don't wanna make a mistake there because it could uh, cost somebody's life if, if you don't recognize a sort of highly occluded pedestrian about to walk on the street. So, um, and right now there are even databases for occluded pedestrians in, in these kinds of uh, tracking scenarios. So the problem has been investigated for a long, long time, um, even in the, in the dark ages before deep learning, people were building systems for cluttered scene analysis. And I'm just shamelessly uh, showing this example here not because it's uh, the, the greatest of, of all time or so, but this is something that I happen to be involved in um, during my PhD, where we already did some sort of fairly, uh, I think at the time sophisticated things, building integrated systems that did recognition, segmentation, stereo vision processing and, and occlusion processing all in one sort of joint, I'll be very simple inference process to, uh, analyze these kinds of cluttered scenes and calculate all the different occlusions, occlusion relations and what object was where and 
just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things we, we did in the, in the pre-deep learning days, um, we, like this particular algorithm that we published here um, over 10 years ago, it would look at the entire scene first and match models for the individual objects into the scene um, and then do this in stereo pairs. So it also had a sense of which object is possibly in front of which other. And then it would sort of step by step iteratively, iteratively parse the scene, uh, recognize the, the frontmost object, accept it, and then use this information to segment out basically these parts of the image that were already explained and then redo the matching of object models um, and taking into account that you know, this is already covered. And if I don't see my object there, it's already explained by this other object being in front. So, um, so but that was sort of a lot of sort of handcrafted uh, programming, not very natural, not very logical as a model of uh, object recognition in the brain. So now we're sort of much more interested in trying to do this with recurrent neural network architectures. And um, there are models for um, object recognition based on recurrent neural networks out there. And in fact, there is mounting evidence that they are better to explain some of the um, neural data uh, from the primate object recognition pathway. And here's one example. And there are also papers that have been looking at recurrent network models of occluded object recognition um, like this work by O'Reilly here that um, argued that uh, recurrent connections in such an object recognition architecture can fill in missing information uh, that was sort of here, as you see, uh, generated by basically fading out parts of the objects, as you see here on the right. And then more recently, Spöhrer et al. had a nice paper where they did occluded digit recognition, either presenting a digit and then fragments of digits on top or presenting multiple digits in the same image and having to re recognize all of them. But this was also, all these approaches have been somewhat limited in the kinds of occlusion, the kinds of recognition setup. Uh, here, for example, um, yeah, the occlusion was just fading out some parts or here the, the stimulus material, the digits had no intra-class variability, but it was really always the same sort of rendered font in exactly the same size with, so quite unnatural and very remote from, um, from everyday vision. So we decided we should sort of come up with some databases and look at this in a sort of somewhat more natural setting. So um, we started out with MNIST to introduce some uh, intra-class variability, so lots of fives that would all look different. And we created scenes with occlusions by taking these digits, putting them on a 32 by 32 canvas, and then putting other digits in front of that. And then also rendering this stereoscopically with the right kinds of disparities for objects at different depths. And then we would get these sort of stereoscopic occluded object stimuli, um, which we could train uh, with our network. So the, the setting, and then we also use other stimuli, the setting is always we have some virtual uh, ground plane on which we place these objects in different locations at different distances. We can render them with just one camera or stereoscopically. And we looked at uh, uh, like, occluded uh, MNIST or fashion MNIST. This has these sort of pieces of clothing which we are arranging here into these different scenes. And then we also worked with this YCB object database that is common, um, common household objects that are used in robotics context. And we looked at two settings here where the target object is always in the center. And the more interesting one on which I'll focus where the target object can be in, in random locations. So it, this is a really difficult problem. You can already tell from these images here that it may not be very easy even for you to recognize what is the, the object here in the back or what is the digit in the back. Um, but we sort of wanted a difficult task so that uh, we can in fact see differences between different 
network architectures that we're going to compare. So, yeah, three data sets. Um, we can also systematically vary the amount of occlusion in some of these data tests. And the, the task is always to recognize the occluded object in the, in the back. Uh, so, and in the following, I'll focus on these random target settings uh, because they're the, the more challenging and more interesting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare different network architectures that have different forms of recurrence or not. So it's always going to be based on uh, yeah, hidden um, layers that are convolutional, uh, two of them, and we have nonlinearities and, and pooling in there. And um, we'll start with, in, with a simple baseline of a feedforward network. And um, then we can add top-down connections lateral connections within a layer or the combination top-down and lateral connections in these convolutional layers. And we name these architectures based on the connectivity that they have. So B stands for bottom-up, BT stands for better bottom-up and top-down, BL for bottom-up and lateral, and BLT, that's sort of the Mercedes, I would say, that's bottom-up, lateral, and top-down. And um, yeah, we also give them different uh, colors here to make it easier to distinguish. And by the way, all these fancy animations, that's the work of Marcus. He has a really uh, good hand for these kinds of things. Now, you may um, be concerned if we're sort of going to compare these different architectures and one has only feed forward connections and another one has also lateral or top down connections. Well, maybe we'll see performance differences in the end because there's just different parametric complexity. They have different numbers of trainable weights. So in order to um, deal with this issue, we are introducing another set of control feedforward networks um, like this BF that has twice the number of filters or BK that uses larger kernel sizes or BD that introduces additional layers so that the total number of learnable parameters ends up being somewhat comparable between the architectures. So the, actually the one with the most learnable parameters is the BF network here with um, depending on how many image channels you have as input or around 40,000 or so. Good. So we have we have four connectivity classes: the B, BT, BL, and BLT. Um, and then we have uh, different variants um, of feedforward networks that are thought to might have a similar number of uh, learnable parameters. So we're ready to take this out for a ride, train these networks now, and see how well they perform on these. Uh, digit tasks. So how do we do this? Well, uh, are, yeah. are, these, are these convolutional? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, right. You said three by three and five. Never yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the weights we need to train are the bottom up weights, the lateral weights, and the top down weights. So this is our recurrent network. So we, we're going to do back propagation through time for which we'll unroll the networks for four time steps and then do 100 epochs of training. And just to, to illustrate the idea of this uh, unrolling in time, uh, here you have the network at one time step and you have the different layers, the two convolutional layers uh, and up to the softmax. And now we sort of copy the network here, time step for time step and then the uh, for example, the top-down connections or the lateral connections are these additional uh, arrows here in the graph, but then it's, it's a graph through which you can basically do your, uh, you propagate back the arrows across the layers and across time to train all these different uh, weight matrices in the end. So let's see some of the results. Um, here is the occluded MNIST data set 
monocular presentation, so there's no stereo here yet. And here we're just for now comparing the feed forward architectures uh, with one another. The BF and the in, enlarged uh, has the enlarged filter size, uh, filter number, bigger kernel size, or the uh, two additional layers, the deeper version, which seems to perform best. But if we compare this with the recurrent uh, architectures, the BT, BL, BLT, so all the recurrent ones are in black and in light gray are the feed forward architectures, you see that we do get uh, imp performance improvements. So we, we're looking at the error rate here, and you see that uh, even the best networks make more than 20% error. So it's a really hard task, as you might already sort of guess from these images here. And if you, if you do the statistics and ask, okay, which of these differences are actually statistically significant, we always display this with this little uh, matrix here. In that case, you see that all the differences are statistically significant. And the little uh, square here, in fact, indicates the comparisons between the uh, recurrent and the feed forward architectures. So this little sub matrix here. If we do the same for the stereo input, we see basically the same picture. Uh, everything gets easier. So uh, overall, the error rates are smaller, but the recurrent networks still outperform the feed forward networks and the the contrast, the difference is in fact even, even higher here. Um, so we have a recurrence advantage that is bigger for the stereoscopic input. Here's the same story for Fashion Imnist, um, almost the same story. Again, apart from one exception here with the BD and the BT, uh, we see that the recurrent architectures perform better than the uh, feed forward architectures and similar here for the for the stereo case. So we see a consistent performance improvement of these recurrent networks for this difficult occlusion task, uh, even compared to the parameter matched feed forward controls that we considered here. Now the question of course is what is happening and, and how, how exactly does the recurrence uh, contribute to this performance improvement. And so we're, we're going to try now to, to open the black box a little bit and try to gain some understanding of what it is that the recurrent networks are doing um, in this setting. Um, Sorry, there's like a question. Yeah. Um, someone is asking, um, are there differences in the effective receptive uh, field size uh, at the top layer between the different models that you are like uh, comparing? Um, I, maybe we can answer that or get back to that at the end because I'm not sure how exactly one would define the effective receptive field size. I mean, in terms of the, the kernel sizes of the feed forward connections, um, the re yeah, I guess probably the answer will be yes, that it becomes effectively bigger because if you have lateral connections in such a network and then you unroll for multiple time steps, you're kind of effectively with every iteration sort of uh, increase the, the visible area. So that that's, would be my quick answer, but maybe we can revisit the question at the end. That's good, thanks. Um, so what we're gonna do first is we're gonna look at the output layer. So this is softmax layer, so we can interpret the activities there as a, as a probability distribution over the different classes. And what we can do now is we can see how this probability distribution evolves over time as the recurrence is operating and the network is sort of cycling, always seeing the same input, but sort of processing it with the recurrent connections. So what I'm showing you here are example stimuli and in uh, blue now, the softmax output uh, for this, for this um, respective stimulus after the first feed forward pass through the network. So that is time step zero means one feed forward pass through the network. And 
Also know that this is a logarithmic scale here. So the differences, so the numbers down here become really, really small in the end. And you see some cases here. So the dashed line always indicates what is the correct answer because you, you may not be able to see that easily, but here it's sort of the seven in the back and here it's a four that is sort of sitting in the back. So the dashed line is what you would want the network in the end to select. And we, we have picked some examples here where uh, after the first feed forward pass, there's actually some other uh, number like here, the eight that has a higher probability uh, assigned by the network. But of course you can, you can imagine what is gonna happen if I now look at subsequent time steps, you see that often we see that these sort of errors after the first feed forward pass uh, get corrected through the recurrent connections and in the end, the peak of the red curve, that is after three recurrent time steps of processing is sort of in the right place and the network recognizes the correct target. So um, conclusion here is that the recurrence, at least in some examples and more often than not, uh, than the other way around, uh, revises incorrect decisions from the feed forward pass through the network. So it corrects, the recurrent connections correct incorrect guesses initially. Maybe more interesting is if we actually look not at the output layer, but look at the layer before where we have some high dimensional representation of these um, yeah, occluded scenes with, with three objects in there. And we're gonna look at this in a um, with with Tisani in a dimensionality reduced space, and what I'm showing you here is how this how different stimuli. So every point is one uh, one stimulus with one target letter. Uh, how this Tisani representation evolves over time, and you see here that initially you have the cluttered scene, the three digits in there. Um, so this is all very cluttered. So one point here, just to be very precise, uh, you know, one pink point here means that it's a scene with three digits, but the digit to be recognized is digit number six here, for example, okay? And you see that as the network uh, processes the stimulus with the recurrent connections, you see that the different classes get sort of separated and mapped onto different, uh, yeah, less overlapping regions um, in, in this high dimensional space. And now it gets interesting. Now we're gonna to show to this network also unoccluded pure stimuli without any distractors. And this is what I'm showing you here in B. So these are the points with a little black circle around them. You see them here initially. So by this point here corresponds to a two presented on blank background without any occluder. While here somewhere what would be a two that has two occluders in front of it, a nine and an eight. And we see that um, these unoccluded digits already after the feed forward pass, they're pretty much disentangled and fall into different regions here in this TCNE space. But now as the network unfolds, something very interesting is happening, I think. You see that the representation of these occluded digits progressively aligns with the representation of these unoccluded digits. So that in the end, this uh, unoccluded two and the two that are, is occluded by the eight and the nine actually come to lie together very close in this high dimensional um, activation space of, of the network in the, in the penultimate layer. So the um, punchline here is that we see a progressive alignment of the occluded and the unoccluded object representations as the recurrent processing unfolds. So that sort of, again, uh, supports the idea that the recurrence somehow the the, the network manages to, to use the recons to find a way to discount the occluding objects. 
Um, and, and here I'm just, right, because this is still pretty cluttered up here, I'm showing you a version where uh, I only have um, the stimuli with a three, and you see how, again, this unfolds and everything ends up being clustered up a couple of time steps in, in one region that is sort of um, more separated from the rest. Good, so we did it. And uh, Frederick, you actually, you need to warn me if my time is about to run out. Um, you have another half an hour. Okay. Another way to look at this is through a technique uh, called uh, class activation maps that are derived from this uh, global average pooling idea. Um, just in a nutshell, you basically, at the end of the network, put this global average pooling layer that sort of sums over the entire uh, feature map here and then feeds into uh, the, the one hot encoding in the last layer. So if we look at the weight from this feature map to this particular class uh, and we go ahead and multiply it with the activation in this map here, and then we do this for all of these different features, then we get some kind of saliency map that tells us which portions of the image were how relevant for uh, the decision that this is an Australian terrier in this image here. So, and Marcos put the same kind of global average pooling layer into his network so we can also follow what the network is doing across time now with the recurrence. And this is indicated here. So on the left, I'm showing you a, a stimulus. Here we need to recognize the letter nine with occluders four and five. Here it's the three with occluders eight and five. And we're showing here this um, attention map um, after the initial feed forward pass and after three time steps of recurrent processing. And here we're showing the difference between the two of them. So. Uh, one minus the other here with the stimuli superimposed. And what you see is that, um, what you can appreciate here is that these attention maps become sort of more, more focused in a way and hone in or zoom in on the target to be recognized. And this is shown here for individual stimuli, but we can do the same game by placing lots of stimuli in one location here or in one location here or in one location there, and then averaging all these attention maps and looking at how these average attention maps evolve over time. And you see here that there's really this sort of focusing uh, on this particular image region where the stimulus is. And you can also do the statistics and show that this sort of, yeah, this tension is sort of, uh, over time significantly narrowing through the recurrent processing. Good, so one last point I wanted to make, um, sort of as a little bit of an orthogonal uh, question here, but since you do have recurrence here in these networks, you naturally also have a memory uh, because right, that's the recurrent connection just brings back the same thing one time step later in a way, or something processed, um, a processed version. And we were thinking whether these networks would then exhibit perceptual phenomena that are well known from, from psychophysics, like these perceptual hysteresis experiments, where here you, you look at the stimulus on the left, you see a man's face, you go, go one over, you still see a man's face and so forth. And at some point you see your perception switching and you start seeing something different. You're seeing an, uh, a kneeling woman here. Um, now, interestingly, if you do the same thing backwards now um, and start looking from the right to the left, you will start seeing a woman, you will see a woman and the, your perception will switch at some point again, but it might, whoopala, it might uh, switch at a different location. It might switch later. Uh, that's what typically happens. So, we have bi-stability here because the stimuli here in this middle region, depending on what you saw before, they will sometimes be perceived one way and sometimes they will be perceived the other way. Um, so we were wondering whether our networks with the recurrence that were trained on these occluded objects would 
exhibit a similar phenomenon. So, um, and show this bistability, this hysteresis. So Marcus used the variational autoencoder to also <clears throat> create these sequences of, of morphs between one digit and another digit here from nine to four. And then we would present these sequences, one image per time step to the networks and see what, how they would interpret that. And here's already a, the result of what that looks like. So these are networks that are um, of the BLT type. So with all the connectivity and they're trained exclusively to recognize these occluded digits here in these uh, kinds of stimuli. And then we're showing them these sequences of morphs and we're keeping track of the softmax output layer of what probabilities they assign to the different classes. And on the forward pass here, okay, it's a nine, it's a nine, and it stays a nine all the way to here. And then it switches to um, the perception of a four. So the probability of nine goes down. And here in the lower graph, we plot the probability of four, and that sort of is going up here. <coughs> but then in the backward pass, you see what we sort of suspected might happen that the perception switches at a later time. And we do have this region of bi-stability where depending <coughs> on what the network perceived before, it will interpret the stimulus one way or another way. And if you do this for uh, different kinds of morphs, you might see different um, scenarios here where the switch right, it will, might happen in different locations and the bi-stable region might sometimes be smaller or sometimes be bigger, but uh, very naturally, these recurrent networks also uh, capture or maybe explain, if you want to use that word, uh, these uh, hysteresis effects, although they've never se even seen the, these kinds of stimuli uh, in, in their training. Okay, that already brings me to the end. Um, I hope I could sort of make a point that uh, recurrent connections can improve occluded object recognition. And um, we've seen examples where these recurrent connections help the network to correct uh, wrong guesses based on the feed forward processing and um, try to make a case that in fact, they seem to be operating to discount the effect of the occluders in these scenes. Um, and um, the recurrence also induces perceptual hysteresis as it would be observed psychophysically. And um, yeah, one thing we want to do is we want to combine this with active vision. Um, that's sort of something left for the future. We've done a lot of work, Gary mentioned it on uh, self-calibrating binocular vision. But here we assumed that the, uh, the, the two virtual eyes were fixating um, correctly the, the object at the back that needed to be recognized. Uh, so it would be only nice to combine these two lines of research, uh, which, um, yeah, we, we've left for the future to do. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. And I'm giving here, or Marcus is really giving here uh, a couple of uh, references. And the work I talked about today, we've just submitted it. And you can just ask us for a preprint and we'll be happy to send it to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Johan, for the, the great talk. Gary is applauding. Uh, so you have time now for questions and discussions. So if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, please uh, just um, ask Johan directly uh, with your mic. Thank you. Any question? Um, beautiful work as usual. Uh, I was wondering if you thought about um, Another way of visualizing what happens over time uh, would be to put everything in the same space by doing like PCA instead of TSNE and uh, looking at how it evolves. I mean, you, you did show it evolving over time, but the space was different every time. Um, just yeah, the reason for that being, uh, Marcos may correct me if I'm wrong, that um, the network is really, if you 
put everything in the same space, then it sort of just travels a great distance uh, from one end to the other. And that's sort of hiding the sort of uh, differences that you, you, you otherwise would, would see. Um, I don't know whether Marcus also looked at PCA. Um, I don't remember that. We found the TSNE to be the most useful, I think, or maybe we haven't tried that many other things. Um, There's a new uh, thing out that's supposed to be an improvement on TSNE. I can't remember the name of it. QMAP, I think you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely something we we should try in the future. Like I, one, one of the things I don't like about this uh, plot is that, uh, of course, as you said, it's not the same uh, space for every time step. And we experimented with uh, TSNE earlier, but I don't remember if we did it with occluded and unoccluded stimulu, stimuli uh, at the same time. So I'm not quite confident if we have data on this, but I, I think that's a great suggestion because then we would have the same space for every time step and we could more easily compare it. It, it may be just this example, but it looks like steps you know, three and four are just simply a reflection or transposition, right? It's left, right, and top down reflected. So maybe you could just undo that. I don't know if that's well, a general. I mean, every time step is clustered um, again, right? It's not the same space. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, we could rotate the space, but I'm not sure if it would be exactly the same. We are minimizing this loss function for each time step separately. And that's the reason why the clusters appear on different sides of the plot. So yeah, you could maybe do some, uh, what's it called when you rotate into the maximum alignment? Uh, for crusties alignment, I think. Um, and then they would sort of be roughly similar. Um, when, you, when you did the stereo, you, are you just giving the network two images to start with? That's it? Yeah, that's it, basically. I mean, um, I mean, yeah. technically that's that's exactly what we do, but there's different ways of doing this. And we do it by giving it two channels, like instead of RGB, we give it RGB, RGB. Okay, that's, yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so the convolutional filters can, you know, basically pick up on neighboring or corresponding image relation uh, locations. I was not quite understanding why the uh, the performance, the error rate was worse with stereo because you have more information, right? Shouldn't the error rates be lower? Oh, no, no. I think that was a misunderstanding. Let me try to uh, share this again. Different y-axis. Um, oops. Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, oh. There's a little bit of a delay here. <laughs> um, yeah, the y-axis on the stereo was was. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, sorry. Yes. Okay. Of course. The stereo yes. is substantially better, um, but it, yeah, it doesn't show because of the scaling. Uh, but the relative improvement is not as good for the uh, right for, uh, for your. Um, uh, I mean, with uh, with the current uh, connections. If you look at the ratios of the, with the stereo the relative improvement is in fact higher. Um, so we think the stereo makes it easier for the recurrent connections to uh, yeah, show their benefit. Uh, no, you, yeah, it looks comparable, you're right, yes. Yeah, we have, I don't know, it might also depend a little bit on, on which particular data set we are looking at here. Um, okay, from mono, did you just pick left or right, or did you average left and right in some way? How did you do mono? We just took one of them. Okay. Yeah, it's always left. I don't know, maybe because I'm left-handed. It's just an arbitrary choice. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would like to quickly follow up on 
a question that I raised. Essentially, uh, I, I was just getting at the point that Joachim just mentioned that the lateral connection sort of expands the receptive field with every time step of processing, right? So it's, I, I mean, I, I guess I have a suggestion for another control uh, for a bottom-up model, which probably either has larger receptive fields uh, by virtue of larger kernels or by using a different kind of a convolution, like a dilated convolution. Uh, yeah. that, that averages over larger receptive fields at each layer. That's a great suggestion. I mean, we haven't we haven't used the dilated convolution, but one of the controls, uh, the BK, was actually using larger kernel size, larger filters, using five by five instead of three by three uh, filters for the convolution. I see. And but, did you try to sort of keep growing it and see a point where the performance matches for the bottom up in BLT or BL? We we didn't. Um, the the BK already had the more parameters than all of the others, and it was still not performing as well. So at that point, we said this is not a good direction to try to increase it even more. Maybe it would have been interesting, but uh, yeah, it it had already lost the race in a way. We felt cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Thanks. But possibly you could have reduced the number of kernels or something to keep parameters down and still grow receptive field size. Yeah, I mean, in the end, it's it's a architecture space with a lot of dimensions. And there are uh, too many races. Yeah, can't do it exhaustively, right? So we went to, took a couple of axes and compensated here, compensated there, but yeah. Yeah, it, it looks like there are interesting differences depending on the task though. So we had a similar framing wherein we compared like a bunch of feedforward and recurrent models. And we found out that larger context helped with dilated convolutions. But then what happened is that this doesn't stand for any kind of task. So on some tasks, um, the dilated convolutions helped and on others it didn't. So I think that's, that's probably one more sample for you to consider. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. and. You're right, right? Because of that one, one has to take all these results with a little bit of salt. Um, mm -hmm. It would be nice to have sort of generalizable results, but um, yeah. But these, these are great, yeah, yeah. No. This, Yeah, what I should mention, I mean, one thing we noticed, and that is sort of still somewhat incomplete, I didn't show you the results for the, uh, the 3D objects, right, that were real 3D rendered objects. Um, well, we, we simply don't have them where they have, so they are um, identical, identical uh, where, where they vary in location. And if we always put them in exactly the same spot, what we saw also for the MNIST and the digits, then, then in fact, the BD network with the additional uh, convolutional layers was actually getting as good as the convolutional, uh, uh, as the recurrent network, or maybe even slightly better in this special case where the, where the stimulus to be recognized is always exactly in the same pixel location. So that is sort of also, you know, good, um, speaking to, to your point, that, yeah, if you change the task a little bit, then all of a sudden it might be a different ar architecture that um, might show some benefit here. Yeah, 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 that's right. Did you also try to consider any kind of cell type diversity in the recurrence? Say some, some recurrent connections being exeditary and the rest being inhibitory, for example? No, we, we didn't have anything like Dale's law. They could all decide to be positive or negative. But uh, interesting that you mentioned that. What we did find is that on average, these recurrent connections tend to become negative. Okay. Um, but I mean, there's a gigantic spread, right? But, but the mean is sort of slightly negative. So they tend to be more inhibitory than excitatory on average. I see. And that holds both for the lateral recount and for the top down. I see. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure myself what, what exactly to make of that, but. I mean, I guess it's trying to specify. 
at some level, but yeah, yeah. I'm not sure either. Yeah. I mean, you're integrating over time. The, there's always something coming from bottom up. Um, well, there's an effect of negative feedback, uh, which leads to stability, stability in electrical networks. And there's actually a relationship. Yeah, stability is in fact a good keyword here because um, right, you, you might wonder what happens, right? We train these networks for a fixed number of time steps over which we do the uh, un unrolling in time. And now you could imagine just keeping, keep going, right? And keep running the network for longer time steps, for more time steps than it has been trained. And then in fact, we do sometimes see these instabilities that the activity just goes haywire. So there is a stability issue here in, in, with these recurrent networks. I mean, personally, I'm, right, I'm, I'm not a great fan of back propagation to start with. So, <laughs> but, um, um it, it works right yep that's why we use it <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think of it as circuit discovery yeah i had a philosophical question perhaps so beginning of your talk you mentioned about the prehistoric area before deep learning but uh, you all know that this field of deep learning is a reiteration of what has been ongoing over the last 30, 40 years. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so yeah, what is different today? I mean, in your, your opinion, what is different today uh, versus uh, the way you and others were, were doing it 30 years ago? Um, well, I mean, things are, things are working really well now, right? We, we have improved algorithms, we have the hardware, we have the data sets, we have collaborators that come to us, please, 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 can you do some machine learning magic on my biomedical data set? Um, it's a nice position to be in, but fundamentally, I don't think that much has changed. And I still think, right, I mean, we're, we're mostly using deep learning in applications, right? We do fun work on, on epilepsy and you know predicting if this animal will have seizures in a few weeks or not based on EEG measurements. And all this is, this is great and a lot of fun. Um, and but I like Gary's point of circuit discovery for sure. Um, and of course, there are also ideas of how uh, the brain may approximate something like back propagation, right? With sort of various kinds of target propagation, other kinds of algorithms. Um, so, so all this is interesting, but um, we still need to provide the labels, right? And I'm, Gary mentioned it, and Gideon is here, right? I've always been very interested in cognitive development where it's not clear where the labels would ever come from. Um, so, yeah, I'm, we're doing more work on reinforcement and unsupervised learning, which I find somewhat more fascinating. Um, but um, of the deep learning work, uh, I think what Marcus has done here is scientifically the most interesting. <laughs> um, other things I, I see mostly as just, you know, crunching numbers, applications, uh, and yeah, those applications are often very interesting in their own right, but the deep learning doesn't get me very excited. Um, I have a question. Um, have you looked at all um, at the recurrent connections in the light of a self-organizing principle. And particularly, um, again, with the uh, slightly negative average uh, recurrence. Um, I'm, I'm a great fan of self-organization, uh, I should say. 
And um, I'm still trying to get my head around on how circuits can self-organize to do useful tasks. And we do a lot of this with, with spiking networks, with unsupervised learning rules and self-organizing to represent sequence inputs and, and things like that. Uh, but here that was really not our intention and, and our focus and we just did back propagation. Um, we did a little bit, as I said, looked at, we looked a little bit at the statistics of the weights, do they become more negative, more positive, but um, we haven't, there's more that could be done, I agree on sort of, yeah, looking at the stability of these networks and um, whether we can sort of, yeah, characterize them in terms of what attractors they form um, and what happens during the learning process with these structures, these yeah, dynamic structures. Great talk. Great to see you, Jochen. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, give us a sort of preview or teaser about how you're going to be incorporating uh, active vision. You know, just thinking about the problem of uh, dealing with occlusion, like as you're just walking or even turning your head or something like that. It's a pretty interesting uh, problem, right? You get some additional um, kinds of information, uh, but there's also, uh, in some cases, more complications. So I was wondering if you could say something about uh, how you're planning to kind of approach that. Um, I, I must admit that my ideas are not very sophisticated yet, but um, I'm, I'm very pragmatic sometimes. And I say, oh, right, we've done this work on how, you know, stereo vision can self-calibrate just based on some information theoretic principles. And then it will, you know, give you virgins behavior for free. So you look at the object that you're interested in and fixate and see it at zero disparity. And in a way, this was the starting point for the for creating the stimuli in, in the current setup, right? So just putting these two things together, you would have something that would then you know make fix virgins eye movements to sometimes fix fixate this and then fixate that stimulus. And um, hopefully right it would then also be able to at that moment through the recurrent connections quickly sort of find a way to discount the occluders um, relative to the object that it currently fixates. But then if it you know, decides to fixate another one, then poof, it would sort of clean up the, the representation uh, for that new stimulus now being fixated. I mean, something like that must be going on, but yeah, I don't have very sophisticated thoughts on that yet other than just trying to put A and B together somehow. Good luck. <laughs> we have time for one last question. So please. I don't think we're going to, to conclude. Uh, so thanks again, Johan, and uh, thanks everyone for the great discussion after the, the talk or so. It's always appreciated. People can expand their ideas a little bit more. Uh, and we might see you next year, maybe Johan, uh, we'll renew the invitation. Wonderful, thank you very much for having me. It was a lot of fun and it was great to, to see so many of you uh, back like in the old days. Fantastic, so have a great day, everyone. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks for joining in. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.